Today's guest, uh, Jonathan Glasser, will be talking about one of the most important artistic traditions to claim descent from medieval Spain, uh, the tradition of Andalusian music, North African Andalusian music. Uh, Jonathan Glasser is one of the leading experts on Andalusian music, and as I learned when he came to my class yesterday, he's also an expert performer of Andalusian music. Uh, so potentially in the Q&A we can make him sing or something. Uh, but but uh, today I think he'll be talking, but he's also a delightful performer in addition to being a very accomplished scholar. Uh, Jonathan completed his PhD in Near Eastern Studies here at Michigan in 2008, and ever since he's been teaching at the College of William and Mary in Virginia, where he's an assistant professor of anthropology. Jonathan is currently working on a book manuscript about Andalusian music in Algeria titled The Lost Paradise, Andalusian Music in Urban North Africa. And uh, what he's going to be presenting today is in part related to the research he's done for that book manuscript, which uh, we hope to see out in print very soon. And he's also about to publish an excerpt from the book in the next issue of the International Journal of Middle East Studies as part of their special issue on North Africa, uh, which is called Maghribi Histories in the Modern Era. So if any of you guys are fascinated by the topic of today's talk, as I hope you will be, you can look for the next issue of Ishmus where there'll be more coming. Uh, so without further ado, Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jonathan Glasser. Uh, thanks so much, Eric, for the introduction and for hosting me here. I've had a really good time. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to be back here. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been a few years since I've been in Michigan. So I've been, I've been, I've been loving uh, my visit here. Can everybody in the back hear me if I speak around this lab? Yeah? yeah? OK, so if you need to hear me more clearly or anything, just Go like this, right? Um, uh, so, you know, it's it's funny having you know this. There's about 26 images and a couple of sound samples that we're not going to see or hear. Um, however, I am going to do my best to kind of uh, use my voice and my hands and perhaps even you know this old-fashioned thing, right, <laughs> to um, to make some of the points um, uh, that that. I might be making uh, with a visual or sonic kind of musical analog. So, um, so this is going to be uh, kind of the old-fashioned version of the talk. <laughs> However, um, uh, hopefully, we'll get into some musical examples uh, at some point in, in some fashion or another. Um, so, uh, I want to begin by confessing uh, that I have been ambivalent about the Andalusianess of Andalusia. Uh, North African Andalusian music since virtually the start of my engagement with the topic in graduate school <coughs> in the belated Huiz building. Right? I say virtually because at the very beginning I was captivated in unironic fashion by the romance of a living tradition with roots in El Andalus, in Arabic El Ferdos and Mafqud, the lost paradise of medieval Islamic Spain. And among other things, I loved the image of poems in the Andalusi Mawasha form, some of them by Andalusi poets, some of them even mentioning El Andalus being sung in contemporary Algiers, Tunis, and Fez, and the conundrums this seemed to thrust before the usual notions of Europe and North Africa and of modernity as a never look back beyond temporal break. But after a few semesters, my starry-eyed wonderment frosted to a harder-edged glint, <laughs> urged on by the oft-repeated scholarly claim that this music was not called Andalusi until the turn of the 20th century, and by lack of clear evidence of musical continuity between Iberia and the Maghreb, I converted to an invented traditions hypothesis that the association of the North African urban Nuba repertoire with El Andalus was the new masquerading for the old, a product of a colonial encounter that perhaps served the search of French and indigenous Maghrebi elites for a sort of colonial métissage. Romantic philology gave way to the age of constructionist extremes. And I apologize to the, to the late uh, and much loved Eric Hobsbawm. Uh, luckily, actual research proved uncooperative. First, I found plenty of evidence that the Andalusi Association was around well before 1900. While this association did seem to assume a new prominence around then, 
in part due to a wider fascination with things Hispano-Moresque in France and among colonial officials in Algeria, and while El Andalus offers rich possibilities for playing with ideas of place, time, and boundaries, what had been a crisp, tart hypothesis started looking bruised and mealy. <laughs> in my <laughs> Second, as my ethnographic research began, mainly in the Moroccan border city of Wujda, I found El Andalus to be everywhere and nowhere. Yes, there was the well-developed narrative of Andalusi musical origins, accepted in broad outlines even by skeptics, complete with a founding figure, the 9th century musician Ziryab, a story of post-1492 trans-Mediterranean transmission, and the alluring claim that parts of the original Andalusi repertoire were lost over time, so that an original set of 24 nubat, or modally defined suites, were gradually reduced to roughly half that number. And yes, I found plenty of deployments of El Andalus there and later in Algeria, such as the naming of amateur music associations for Granada, Cordoba, El Andalus, or Ziryab, as well as collaborations between, with, uh, with European musicians justified by claims of connection between European and North African musical practices by way of El Andalus. On the other hand, El Andalus was nowhere, or at least held a more modest place than I had expected and that the foregoing would suggest. With few exceptions, there is little sense of Andalusian music being the keep of people of Andalusi origin. And talk of the music's Andalusi origin was just not very frequent, spontaneous, or impassioned as compared to talk about recent genealogies of transmission from master to disciple. In addition to genealogy, my ear was caught by the amateur association form through which much Andalusian music making takes place. When I say association here, I mean an organization, an ensemble. The printed collections of poetic texts that people kept referring to, and the all-encompassing discourse of endangerment and safeguard. And I was struck how all of this, genealogies, amateur associations, printed collections, and the discourse of safeguard and restoration, seem to have undergone certain formative processes in early 20th century. El Andalus went underground. But lately, it's been re-emerging re for me in two ways. The first, a more sober version of the philological approach, asks if what is known today as Andalusian music came from El Andalus. A major inspiration here has been Dwight Reynolds' uncovering of the best evidence to date of a transfer from El Andalus to the Maghreb. And stay tuned for a very interesting uh, piece we'll be publishing soon about this. The second, my focus today, is basically semantic. I ask about meaning in a given present beyond a moment of originary transmission. In many ways, this orientation is within the mainstream of anthropological and ethnomusicological research, <coughs> even if there are relatively few studies of musical origin narratives per se. But there are a few things that may be less familiar about today's approach. First, I'm particularly interested in addressing this everywhere, nowhere quality of El Andalus. How is it that it veers into and out of view? Why is it hard to shake? How does the narrative relate to its competitors, such as genealogy? And second, I'm eager to go beyond the view of origin narrative, familiar from a narrow but influ influential reading of Malinowski's charter myth thesis, that treats such stories primarily as a reflex of present needs, a view that can neglect its semiotic and temporal specificities, efficacies, and generativities. In order to reach toward these goals, I will emphasize how the Andalusianness of Andalusian music means, somewhat more than what it means, taking my ethnographic present as the time frame. If today I am wantonly ahistorical, my hope is that the particular approach I am developing can be put to good historicizing ends. So I'm wearing a kind of ahistorical hat today, um, but uh, there's another hat over there that I also like. Uh, the main theoretical tools here come from two boxes. 
One marked Charles Sanders Pierce purse, the other marked Bakhtin. First among those in the purse box is the concept of indexicality, the relationship of pointing that may exist between two terms, what Michael Silverstein calls a relationship of co-occurrence within a frame. Thus, Andalusi music, say, is said to index or point to El Andalus. It also indexes social characteristics associated with its producers and consumers. Iconicity, on the other hand, refers to the relationship between two or more terms based on a formal resemblance, such as that between two pieces of music that would allow them to both be identified as tokens or representatives of the Andalusi genre. So note here that indexicality and iconicity are not mutually exclusive. The iconic relationship between these two pieces, for example, facilitates the sense of their relationship of co-occurrence within a genre frame. Right? So indexicality and iconicity together here. From the Bachtin box, I will identify El Andalus talk as a speech genre, a way of speaking marked by certain internal formal qualities and or external indexical links to a context of use. And I will draw uh, upon the term chronotope in Silverstein's exegesis, the temporally and spatially particular envelope in the narrated universe of social space-time in which and through which narrative characters move. All right, so <coughs> chrono and tope being uh, time and space being brought together. The most obvious, though not the only chronotope in this talk, is El Andalus medieval Islamic Spain. I'm going to elaborate these concepts as I argue that to make sense of Andalusian music's Andalusianess, we must recognize two aspects of indexicality at work. One pointing to the chronotope of El Andalus, and the other pointing to Andalusian music as a genre. And I hope to show why we must partly disentangle these aspects while recognizing the many forms of relationship they assume. I will offer a series of ethnographic examples, a case of mapping, a serious joke, the wild card of modern Spain, and to conclude their intertwining of genealogy, materiality, and lostness. But to start, let's look at some names and acts of naming. In this section right here, it's called Border Troubles on Names and Naming. So the most obvious way Andalusian music is Andalusi is through its name. In its broadest Maghrebi context, Andalusian music refers to an array of urban musical traditions, in aggregate or individually, based in a five-part nuba form. On the ground, the naming practices are richer and more bewildering. Instead of trying and failing to give an exhaustive account, I will focus on naming in the Nuba tradition of Algiers, Tlemcen, and their musical environs in Algeria and Morocco, with special attention to the Moroccan border city of Wujda. My overall narrative strategy here is autobiographical, in part to profit from my own journey towards appellative competence, and in part to trace a terrestrial trajectory from Fes to Wujda that traverses distinct Andalusi musical traditions. Crossing these genre boundaries helps tease out the local and translocal instantiation of Andalusi musical practices and the ways in which practitioners both play up and smooth over tensions that enter into that multiplicity. In turn, it demonstrates how the Andalusi attribution is both about a past place and about a genre. Now, written and oral uh, accounts usually identify the Andalusian music of Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco with three distinctly named traditions that grossly coincide with these three nation states. So this is where like not relying on um, not handwritten maps gets kind of embarrassing. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a very kind of basically kind of schematic thing here. Um, you know, totally forgive me about about what this looks like. But I'm going to say like Morocco, Algeria, okay, <laughs> Tunisia, all right. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mark the term Ala for Morocco with a focus on Fez <coughs> and Tetouan. I'm going to use the terms Ranati 
for Grenadin and Sana'a for Western and Central Algeria. And I'm going to use Malu for Tunis and Tunisia and parts of Eastern Algeria with it centered on Constantine. So an ala, literally instrument, but also sometimes used to refer to a musical troupe, is associated with Fes and Tetuan, and is practiced in many other Moroccan cities as well. It sometimes comes with an Andalusi modifier, as in el ala el Andalusia. Ma'aluf, over here, literally composed or written, is associated with Tunisia and the eastern Algerian city of Constantine and its environs. And in central and western Algeria, one can find both Sana'a, literally craft, and Arnati, Grenadin. But the latter term has become more frequent around Tlemcen um, and this one uh, around Algiers. Broadly speaking, the three appellations, Malouf, Sana'a, Arnati, and Ala, map onto three distinct, though partly overlapping, Nuba structures and sonnet repertoires. There is also a differentiation within these generic territories, particularly, particularly between cities and ensembles. So when we talk about Ala, Rarnati, or Sana'a, and Ma'aluf, we're actually talking about three different Nuba structures, three different forms that overlap somewhat but are also distinctive. Note that Andalusian music is always from a specific regional and municipal tradition. Now these regionally specific names and practices exist beside less specific names, including La Musique Andalouse, El Musica El Andalusia, and El Tarab El Andalusi, all of them translatable as Andalusi music, as well as derivative adjectival forms like Andalusi, Andalu, and even Andalus. In theory, these terms name the type of which the regionally specific terms and traditions are tokens. But as we will see, they are not always purely meta-generic. Often they are actually used for specific traditions, and sometimes the association sticks. All right, so we have these regionally specific terms, and then we have these kind of terms that are sometimes used as cover-all terms. Andalusi, Andalou, uh, La Musique Andalouse, El Musique Andalusia. Take, for example, my initial quest to, quote, find Ranati in Morocco in the summer of 2004, equipped with an old recording of the Algerian performer Salim Hilali, singing something I was told was Ranati, an exploratory grant from, uh, from University of Michigan, and the advice that to find Ranati in Morocco, I go to Rabat and to the border town of Wujda, over here. In Rabat, my search for recordings in the shops generally turned up short, except for cassettes of Haj Ahmed Piro, a local singer and retired greengrocer who is Morocco's best-known Ranati performer. In Fes, en route to Wujda, I found some of the same recordings of Haj Piro I'd already seen. Occasionally, shopkeepers would urge me to go on to Wujda, where I was told I might find what I was looking for in greater abundance. In Fes, however, signs of other difficulties arose on the occasions when, in my response, in response to my request for Harnati, I was handed recordings of Allah. For those who either did not know about the difference or simply wanted to make a sale, Harnati was another way of asking about Allah, likely by tracing Harnati to Granada, placing Granada in El Andalus, and connecting El Andalus back to his term Andalusi. In such a case, the failure to take up my own term as a reference to a distinct genre stemmed from the absence of a sense of any such distinct genre. With no available object to set it aside, my term of reference was assimilated to the nearest at hand. The guide to ascertaining the nearest object was a concept of a, spa a spatio-temporal El Andalus as a semiotic linking space. Once in Wujda, although I found fewer commercially available recordings of Ranati than I had hoped for, people I met had no trouble linking Ranati to my intended object. Wujda is home to a thriving Ranati scene 
with a research institute devoted to the study of this music, an annual state-sponsored Ranati festival featuring local and visiting artists, and more than half a dozen amateur associations dedicated to the teaching and performance of this repertoire. On the other hand, there I faced additional term terminological challenges. During my initial visit, while speaking with a young percussionist in one of the associations, I made the mistake of referring to what he and his colleagues were playing during rehearsal as Andalusi. What I was hearing, I was told, was Ranati, not Andalusi. And to hear the latter, I'd have to go back to Fess. <laughs> so what was happening here? Following a reverse path from the shopkeepers, I assumed Ranati was self-evidently Andalusi, and could be expressed through the Arabic term Andalusi. But in Wujda, to speak of Andalusi is to speak of Allah. All right? It's to speak of Allah, which is often referred to in Morocco simply as a tarab el Andalusi. So in this exchange, the chain of associations that the Fes shopkeepers and I had shared was being short circuited. And this fracture piggybacked on a fractured sonic space whose characteristics overpowered any available extra-musical knowledge. The admonition to separate Ranati from Andalusi used a sharp sense of genre differentiation to treat these terms in a way that minimized their attachment to Granada and El Andalus, and emphasized their status as signifiers of discrete genres. Here, Ranati and Andalusi were indeed being treated as what are sometimes called source-identifying indexicals, but only if we understand source more as a location in a contemporary generic field <coughs> than in a spatio-temporal one. The generic field draws upon the same materials as found in the spatio-temporal one, but rearranges and revalues them. Now, let me touch on three hypotheticals before moving on to the next section. First, have you been sitting in Algiers, saying Andalusi, or Etarab el Andalusi, would likely have been understood as an unproblematic, though slightly unusual way of referring to the music the percussionist was playing. In other words, it's Wujda's specific placement that made Andalusi a so-called foreign appellation. Second, if instead of referring to what I had heard in Wujda as Andalusi, I'd refer to it as Andalu, so using the French uh, adjective uh, rather than the Arabic, the percussionist might not have corrected me. In Algeria, Andal is a common term for the Algiers Tlemcen Nuba repertoire, set apart from the Ma'aluf of Tunisia and eastern Algeria. And the same holds true in Wujda. And third, had I used the somewhat pedantic term El Musiqa El Andalusia or La Musique Andalouse, this may have been acceptable since they are rare enough in everyday speech to conserve their generalizing, generic, in the usual sense of the word generic, ring. In other words, in Wujda, Andalusi is not Andalou, but both are tokens of la musique Andalouse, or el musica el Andalusia. Such metageneric <coughs> terms are useful for drawing connections across localized spheres of reference, as long as they are sufficiently rare, but they are not the only way to do so. One can also reach toward a sense of the meta-generic by way of analogy, as in the case of a musician in Tlemcen explaining to me that Allah is the Arnati of Morocco. But my main point here is to show an instance when chronotope and genre contrast in the arrangement of the materials in common so as to reach toward maximal distinctiveness. Right? So here, chronotope and genre are kind of at their maximal uh, differentiation. The next section I'm calling Placing Andalusi Music. So thus far, I've been talking about a genre field and a chronotope that are not interacting with one another beyond sharing materials, albeit in different arrangements. Most of the time, however, they interact very closely and according to several patterns. In my coming examples, I want to explore a few of these patterns. And in the first one, my focus is going to be on questions of place and the way chronotope and genre can come together in such a way that in keeping uh, with the charter myth hypothesis, there's a sort of semantic flow that goes mainly from genre to chronotope. 
And another way of thinking about this is that there are, in fact, two chronotopes at work here. One that is essentially extra musical, and the other that is generated from within the genre practice, in part through naming. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you what I mean here. So we have genre practice. We have naming that is a kind of part of that practice. And we have what I'm calling an internal chronotope that emerges from that practice. And we also have what I'm calling for now an external chronotope or an extra musical chronotope. All right? And I'm going to kind of think of these as in terms of this chronotope in relation to this one. So I'm calling these the external and the internal chronotope, respectively. So perhaps the most striking example of such a semantic flow going from here through into here, uh, a flow uh, where we have, that goes mainly from genre to, chrono, uh, to the, chrono, uh, the external chronotope. Perhaps the most striking example of this is a continuation from the previous discussion of Andalusi versus Arnati. So a few years after the conversation with a percussionist, a middle-aged amateur musician and enthusiast, also in Wujda, in explaining to me the difference between Arnati and Andalusi in the sense of Ala, asserted that the former, Arnati, came from Granada, but that Andalusi came from El Andalus. So this is a classic instance of the process that Judith Irvine and Susan Gall have termed fractal recursivity, which they describe as the projection of an opposition salient at some level of relationship onto some other level. So working by analogy from the genres themselves, this enthusiast was intimating that Granada and uh, Andalus are distinct, discrete places, rather than a place within another place. Right? So this assertion of genre difference contrasts with the percussionists, and that it shows how an emphasis on generic indexicality can colonize the external chronotopic ground by way of the internal chronotope, rewriting normative geography on root. Right? So Granada is no longer in El Andalus. This is colonizing this. So here is El Andalus, but differently from the case of the Fest shopkeepers. So unlike the shopkeepers who draw on an extra musical <coughs> image of El Andalus, the external chronotope, to interpret a question about musical difference, this speaker's chronotopic image comes primarily from inside Andalusian music. I view this as a variation on a more elaborate process of linking the contemporary musical terrain to the geography of El Andalus. And the most obvious and interesting examples is the ex explanation of distinctions between Ala, Arnati, and Maluf by recourse to migrations from varied parts of Iberia. So according to one tradition, Refugees from Cordoba brought their music to Tlemcen, those from Seville brought theirs to Tunis, and those from Valencia and Granada brought theirs to Fes and Tetuan. So interestingly enough, El Andalus as a whole is matching up with El Andalusi music as a whole. The external and the internal chronotypes are being paired here. And the tokens of Andalusi music are being aligned with the tokens, i.e. the key component cities of El Andalus. But also note that these alignments don't map perfectly onto the generic field. So if Arnati means Granadan and is associated mainly with Tlemcen and Algiers, then Tlemcen ought to be the destination for the Granadans, right? Not for the people um, uh, from, uh, from Cordoba. So I point this out not to make any normative claims, but rather to point out that the two maps, these two chronotopes, are distinct even when the efforts at alignment are otherwise relatively successful. Practitioners use El Andalus to account for the presence or absence of Andalusian music in specific locales in many other ways as well. Hence, musicians in Tlemcen suggested I visit Bijaya, since a history of Andalusian settlement in that city guarantees an abundance of high-quality Andalusian music. And in Morocco, more than one person has told me that the presence of the Arnati in Rabat and Wujda and the past presence of Arnati in Tangiers and Tetuan was due to the passage of the Grenadans through these cities and or their settle settlement there. This assertion can overlap with the documented presence of Algerian functionaries in Morocco during the French protectorate 
many of them music lovers from Tlemcen. Conversely, the absence of the Nuba in locations close to Nuba centers is sometimes explained by an absence of Andalusi migrants. Consider comments from a professional musician, an ensemble leader from Wujda, riffing on whether there was an Ornati in Wujda before the arrival in the 1920s of an Algerian school teacher, Mohammed bin Smail, who founded the city's first Andalusi music association. And I quote, one day you take some onions. You've been told that it's impossible to grow onions in Michigan, for example that you don't have onions, that no, you don't have this, that is impossible. You try one day, you plant the onions on a farm near you, and it grows. This can't be true. They said it won't work here, but it did. There's someone who will come to you and say, a long time ago, they grew onions here. It's for that reason that they succeeded. And I come back to Ranati. Why did the Ranati? It existed in Wujda, it existed in Taza, it existed in Tetuan, it existed in Rabat, it existed in Marrakesh, it existed in Fes, it existed in, Sa in, in, in Saleh, in Sla. Why didn't it remain in all these cities? Why did it remain only in Wujda? Because it found that there were very old families here. You'll tell me that we are on the frontier with Tlemcen. Yes, this is the frontier with Tlemcen. But Marnia, there's no Ranati in Marnia. Marnia is 20 kilometers from us, and there's no Ranati. But in Tlemcen, there is. So this is not the reason that Wujda is on the frontier with Tlemcen, because between Wujda and Tlemcen, there's Marnia, and in Marnia there's no Ranati. You see, this is to say that Ranati, because it existed here before Ben Smail, if Ranati music succeeded here, it's because it existed here before, and there were families who loved it. So the presence of migrants is not only used to account for repertorial presence or absence, but also for the mo movements of instruments. So the Rabab, a two-stringed fiddle, plays a central role in some Andalusi music ensembles, and the form it takes in the Nuba repertoire is popularly traced to El Andalus. More controversial is the contention that its competitor, the violin, usually understood as a modern import to North Africa, in fact originated in El Andalus and diffused northward into Western Europe and southward into the Maghreb. The presence of actual migrants can in some instances even be dispensed with for the invocation of sheer proximity to El Andalus to explain features of contemporary musical practice. For example, when I asked one connoisseur why there are so many women in the Wujda ensembles as compared to the Ala orchestras of the Moroccan center, he drew a map of northern Morocco and southern Spain, marking out Granada, Wujda, Rabat, and Fes, and pointing out the relative distance of Wujda, Fes, and Rabat to Granada, he said, see, which is closer to Granada, so there's more civilization, more Hadan. <laughs> I could go on. El Andalus explains why Moroccan Jewish singers sound Algerian, why Andalusi song texts are sad, why the Nuba is so complex, why transmission must be exact. In short, El Andalus is what's been called by Nicholas Thomas a promiscuous object that can be tied to a diverse, changing array of practices. The list is indefinite both because El Andalus is an exceptionally capacious sign and because practitioners' engagement with the world and thereby with contingency is indefinitely various. Yet note that the external chronotope is not endlessly malleable. It has characteristics suited for making some correspondences and not others. The most believable claims draw on elements of the external chronotope that look like the genre terrain, and they do their best to align them. I'm going to return to the question of place and capaciousness in the conclusion, but first let's touch on a pattern with a somewhat different semantic flow from the one we just looked at. And this section is called Ahl al-Andalus, the people of al-Andalus. <coughs> Consider the framing banter of an announcer at an Andalusian music festival in Algiers that I attended in May 2009. The context was the finale in a month-long festival sponsored by a municipal organization featuring performances from the Nuba repertoire by Algerian associations, as well as statements from various Andalusian music luminaries. During his comments, the announcer veered into an unscripted discussion of the merits of Andalusian music and the festival's success, and it began to engage in a speech genre unto itself, a contrast of Andalusian music with Rai, an Algerian popular music associated with youth and disdained by many Andalusian enthusiasts. This is a widespread form of social critique in such circles, but most interesting for today is his use of a form of appellative play, repeatedly 
the announcer contrasted Ashab Rai, the followers of Rai, with Ahl Andalus, the people of Al Andalus, which is a standard way of talking about medieval Iberia's inhabitants, but is here being re redirected to the devotees of Andalusian music. So when he says Ahl Andalus, he's talking about, uh, first he's talking about the lovers of Andalusian music. Or take another case of such serious joking. In a friendly argument I was party to at an association headquarters in Oran. The dispute pitted two young Andalusian music practitioners against an outsider to the scene who teaches Western music theory. The latter was arguing that Andalusian music changes because of failures in the transmission of melodies. Western classical music of the past centuries, on the other hand, she said, has not changed substantially thanks to notation. Just wait 30 years until you have kids and they're playing in the association, and you'll hear how different it all sounds, she chided. In, in response, one of the two young men laughed while quoting a famous line from the Andalusia repertoire of the region, Ahl Andalus yafhamu al ishara The people of the Andalus understand the meaning. In other words, Andalusian music lovers get it, and you don't. <laughs> Again, the performative force and wit of the statement hinges on the use of Andalus to refer chiefly here to the musical genre. But unlike the example of Andalusi versus Ranadi, or even the surmising of correspondences in the example of place rhetoric, here is a highly conscious play on words that establishes an analogy between today's and yesterday's Ahl Andalus. Its primary function is to perform a generic and social differentiation in the present by invocation of a quasi-ethnic genealogical distinction rooted in past place and movement. The implications go far. If there is an analogy between the people of Andalus then and now, then today's enthusiasts are also the paragons of sophistication and are beleaguered, doomed, or lost. And indeed, Andalusian music practitioners are proud of their cause, intensely aware of their past, convinced that their numbers have diminished, and protective of a repertoire that many say is in danger of loss or vulgarization. These claims are not simply being asserted here, but are being performed through a particular move. In both cases, though more so in the second, the speakers are quoting from the repertoire itself. The repertoire itself is one of the things that Andalusian music practitioners by nature encounter in the world. In other words, the Andalusian use of Andalusian music and of Andalus itself is partly stored within forms of address internal to the canon forms that get re-articulated through use. Redirecting these references works towards several ends. It draws a connection between chronotope and genre in such a way as to create a semantic flow that goes mainly from chronotope in both varieties up into genre, and it performs a mastery of the repertoire while playfully intimating that the repertoire speaks directly to the present. It's not too difficult to see how this can be deployed for more serious ends as well as in the performance of uh, parts of the repertoire in <coughs> concerts where uh, Andalus get invoked uh, in the actual performance in, in the song lyrics. <coughs> in this next section I'm calling Modern Spain. So what about when practitioners meet the world and the world is Spain? Modern Spain throws something of a wrench into the chronotopic works in that it presents the challenge of matching up the chronotope whether external, internal, or both, with the chronotope's very pal palpable afterlife. The result, of the, uh, uh, the result of the challenge of alignment can be striking and strikingly productive. Take one young woman's reminiscence of her trip to Granada in 2001 with fellow association members. She reported how their visit there, and particularly to the grounds and buildings of the Alhambra, gave her a vivid sense of what she had been singing about for all those many years up until that point, and why it was to be an important and worthwhile pursuit for her in the future. Note that the power of El Andalus in this example does not lie simply in a vague, romantic, empty image of the past, but rather in the living reality of its material traces, the sense of simultaneity, plenitude, and historicity this can bring. El Andalus, she seems to be saying, was real. What the genre is singing about is real. The sense of a discovery of a living, though hidden reality, shows up in many other practitioners' accounts. For example, one middle-aged Moroccan music enthusiast recounted to me his visit to Seville. He spoke of staying in a pension, 
and hearing the maid singing as she worked. She was, in his words, singing a flamenco mawab, an Eastern Arabic term for an unmetered vocal improvisation that was just like a Marathi mawab. Here, an iconic relationship between two kinds of singing, underlined by the use of an Arabic term, term that happens, happens to come from outside either tradition, is obliquely explained by an applied derivation from a common source not far beneath their feet. Again, Al-Andalus is real, it's palpable, the proof here being a sonic trace. And in recent years, there have been numerous instances of musical collaboration between Spanish musicians and North African Andalusian musical performers that draw on a similar logic, though framed within a multiculturalist idiom. Now, in many ways, this is not so new. There are many cases of mid-20th century musicians, uh, including Salim Hilali, who I mentioned before, who consciously drew on flamenco and other forms of Spanish popular music in their innovations of the Andalusian repertoire. So one <coughs> variant melody for the song Ya Qalbi Khali al Hal, uh, attributed to Sheikh Saleh, a leading singer in mid-20th century, Wujda and Tlemcen, is said to have uh, approximated a modern Spanish uh, Andalusian sound, right, not and Andalusian sound, to ap appeal to Wujda's large population of Spanish-speaking, though nominally French settlers. So instead of singing, um, this version goes, um, so uh, you can obviously hear uh, this kind of reaching toward this, uh, this uh, southern Spanish sound. In such instances, we have a reaching toward modern Spain that is also an innovation within North African Andalusian practice, a reaching toward a sense of recognition and continuity. It's as if to say that if the connection between external and internal chronotope and genre uh, is real, then it is possible to bring this bond into connection with the chronotopic afterlife that is modern Spain. In a related way, there are reports of contemporary Moroccan Andalusian musicians going to Spain to actually expand their repertoire by listening to contemporary early music ensembles. Thus, the Andalusianness of Andalusian music provides the ground on which some North African performers are lately said to incorporate tunes played by Spanish early music ensembles as a strategy for enlarging an ostensibly fixed repertoire. According to this logic, if much of the repertoire was lost in Spain, then it remains possible to find remin remnants there, just as European early music ensembles have looked to North Africa for remnants of the medieval European musical past. In all these cases, there is not so much a semantic flow from genre to external chronotype or vice versa, as much as a sense of confirming or furthering their alignment through recognition of sensual traces of the chronotope of Andalus within the chronotope of modern Spain. <laughs> I hope my attempt to, to decompose a semiotic knot into a musical practice that contains naming and an internal chronotope which in turn is in relationship with, with what I've been calling the external chronotope, helps to account for why Andalusian music's Andalusianness is not as obvious as one might first expect, and at the same time, why something so elusive can be so profoundly resilient. Now let me end by thinking about how El Andalus talk relates to what at first glance is a competitor, and one with which I have been concerned in my wider research, and that's genealogical talk. With the exception of the distant founding figure of Ziryad, genealogical talk focuses almost entirely on the last century of music practitioners and is resolutely local. In many ways, this is an alternative resource for sourcing or authenticating people and knowledge, similar to El Andalus talk in its effects and possible uses, but distinct in its chronotopic specificities and vividness. But on second thought, we have been encountering genealogical claims all through this talk. The linking of North African places to Andalusian ones through waves of Andalusian migrants intuits a chain of transmission of musical goods. The discussion of onions and ranati is part of an attempt to assert a local pedigree that long predates the 1920s. The young performer's story of visiting the Alhambra is part of a more personal genealogy of commitment and of an establishment of connection between a repertoire and a storied place and its afterlife. 
And naming an association for Ziryab resembles the practice of naming associations after a 20th century sheikh, such as a, like an association of Ahbab Sheikh Larbi bin Sari, uh, the devotees of Sheikh Larbi, or the devotees of Sheikh Sari. <coughs> Particularly in explanations of how Andalusi music arrived in specific places, Al Andalus helps account for the success of the known genealogies. Thus, genealogies, even if they peter out, point, index, a deeper presence or ultimate cause. And if we recall the potential role of El Andalus in building a sense of underlying unity in the face of generic diversity, then we can conceive of El Andalus talk as acting to reconcile the multiplicity inherent in the genealogical imagination. But it's the report of performers enlarging the repertoire by poaching from early music groups in Spain that is key to the link between genealogical and El Andalus talk. Turning to these groups resembles the borrowing of repertoire from other Nuba traditions, as when elements of the Ala repertoire are used to enrich the Algiers to Limsan repertoire, or vice versa. Finding things left behind in Spain is not so different from practitioners talking about discovering bits of the repertoire in particular Maghrebi places, as in the comment one musician made on during I was on my way to Tangier to look for traces of Harnaki repertoire. Go, he said, because, he, in, I quote, Larvi bin Sari, a famous sheikh, left lots of things there in his travels. And where are these things? They reside, of course, in people and are received from people. For what the resort to Spanish ensembles resembles even more is the well-attested phenomenon of one musical sheikh poaching song texts from another, or the dead sheikh phenomenon, when a performer gets song texts from a dying sheikh, or by listening to homemade recordings of a dead one, or alternatively, when a performer claims to get songs from such a source. Uh, Ruth Davis, um, who's done uh, uh, some very interesting work on Maluf in Tunisia, suggests that this is one strategy for introducing innovation into a largely fixed repertoire. The idea of receiving or stealing song texts from a sheikh or claiming to do so gets at much of the local semiotic ideology of musical materiality. In Andalusi musical parlance, song texts are things, hawaij, gems, tuha, sinai, handicrafts, ashgal, works, luggage or stock and trade, bagage, that one can give, receive, take, bring, leave behind, hoard, bury. And these song texts reside in existentially local people and become accessible through contact with them. It is in the long-standing idiom of Andalusi circles of the Algiers to Lamsan tradition, by shuyuk bringing their knowledge to the grave, the repertoire is lost. And it is by seeking out the living or through recording scholarly research or even dreams, the dead, that the lost, el mafqul, may be regained. The homology between El Andalus and the genealogical transmission of musical valuables starts to become clear now. The repertoire is the bagage from El Andalus, a cargo that is also an individual's body of musical knowledge, sometimes carried in textual vessels, sifan, a body that is sometimes interchangeable with the term patrimoine, used here in the sense of an individual's rather than a collective's body of knowledge. The term for lost repertoire, el mafqul, of course resonates with el fedos el mafqul, the lost paradise, the standard euphemism for el andalus. And saving the repertoire, quote, from shipwreck, <coughs> is one way to talk about the work of safeguard, revival, in defense of a collective anonymous patrimony. In this deep metaphor, the chronotope or chronotopes and the genealogical ground of generic reality are so closely aligned as to freely flow into one another so that we can't really talk about genealogical and El Andalus talk as ontologically separate speech genres. Rather, they are both modalities, or are they one modality, for thinking about ideologies in actual instances of movement, transmission, value, danger, and loss. So I would revise our understanding of the El Andalus chronotope in both its forms. It is not about a roughly stationary space-time envelope, but rather about a trajectory of movement from a place to another place, an irreversible transmission across water and land that translates into transmission from master to disciple. I want to end with a description derived from my field notes of an intimate rehearsal in Wujda in 2006 
led by prominent musicians whose father was a renowned performer in the region. The event illustrates the intertwining of the genealogical and El Andalus at many levels. Listen for the gap in comprehension embedded in the repertoire, the way it opens an opportunity to reach back to El Andalus in a more recent past in order to elucidate its meaning, all the many forms of sourcing blending one with the other. Mohammed was working with us on a movement from the Nuba in the mode Mjenma. At the end of one of the lines, he sang the vocables Ya La Lan, a common set of syllables in Andalusian music usually understood to be non-referential, and he suddenly stopped. He turned to me and asked if I knew what it refers to. I said a bird, and he said no, it's the name of a river in El Andalus. This is something that the people who play Allah don't know, he told me. How did he find it out? After his father died, a sheikh, a colleague of his father's, who was older than his father, would come by to talk and reminisce. He would come by and talk about the old people and the old days of the association. <coughs> this sheikh had learned part of Nuba Hussein, the Nuba in the Mode Hussein, as a child, just by listening, because he had been the one to prepare coffee and tea for the association members when we met. It was he who imparted the information to Muhammad about Yal al One day after his visit, Muhammad looked through a detailed map of Spain. He looked and looked, and finally, in the south of Spain, he found a little river, a stream called La Lan. There are lots of things we don't know, he said. Thanks so much for listening, and I know this is like the beginning of, of break, so thanks so much for, for all being here. Um, so, Eric, is that right if I just kind of Please. like yeah. need to play both roles? Huh? Do you have any recordings of songs that you collected the Yes, absolutely. Recording? Yes, I do. I have I have lots of recordings. I would I would I would have loved to. I would have loved to. Um, if you if you stick around, I can I can I can bring up some on, on my computer. Uh, it's probably not, it's probably not going to project for a while uh, into the back. Uh, but there's lots and lots. There's a very rich, uh, both studio uh, uh, recordings and uh, live recordings as well. Um, that's been true. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Uh, uh, sure. Sure. Uh, may I, uh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Um, and, th and that's been true. Uh, uh, in fact. Uh, Recordings in Algeria uh, of Andalusian music began uh, around 1905. So there's a there's a very very rich. Well, uh, aside question: How does the how do the the songs of modern artists like Chef Mami and all these uh, mm -hmm. the newer uh, new right. age singers? Right. Okay. How do they uh, uh, the the and impressed or affected by the Andalusi. Okay, that's an interesting question. And um, old right. So, uh, North African. Okay, so uh, Andalusi uh, kind of uh, was alluding to before this idea of kind of uh, taking the Rai as kind of the negative, uh, kind of the, neg the opposite of Andalusi, right? Uh, it's very common in Andalusi music circles to assert this is like the opposite of, of Shebman. Right, um, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, and this gets this is a whole other talk about the idea of rai as a genre, which is a very complicated and kind of messy uh, story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people uh, sometimes allude to repertoire uh, that people talk about as one of the sources of contemporary rai music, uh, and some of that repertoire happens to be kind of shared with the broader kind of nuba complex. So uh, when we talk about the nuba as being at the center of Andalusian music, uh, uh, there's fuzzy borders here. There's other repertoires that are tend to kind of get conflated within that Andalusian music uh, label. And a few of those things at the very border here happen to be also at the very border of the kind of origin narrative of Rai. So uh, it, it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, but uh, in terms of Shev Mami, he, within the Andalusian music community, he's like the, uh, he and all the other Rai uh, musicians are basically the, um, uh, the, the, the opposite of, of everything that Andalusian music stands for. Uh, 
Um, so that's the kind of that's the short answer uh, to that. Now talking about generations, do younger generation enjoy this? Uh, Absolutely, uh, these associations are full of young people, uh, and that's something uh, that you would see uh, in, in the images. Uh, the associations are are largely young people, uh, and uh, there's there's many generations who have gone through these. <coughs> I have a question that's about the, kind of the sense of history that's yeah. embedded in performances of like, contemporary and music. Obviously, Rai music is like the, the, the quintessence of the modern, right? I would mm -hmm. imagine that's how it feels. But, mm -hmm. but is there any sense of the um, uh, of the depth of history that's embedded in this of this music to get a sense of, like, especially of archaizing, archaizing um, impulses? Or I'm especially interested in linguistic archaisms that are accepted, you know, sort of transmitted in the tradition as, as part of its, its um, you know, as evidence of its validity or its mm. legitimacy or whatever, but also a sort of musically right. archaizing. Okay, um, well, there, there's two uh, aspects of The linguistic side is very interesting. Um, uh, there's been a kind of, uh, uh, in fact, a centuries-old textualizing project in Andalusian musical circles. So people keep uh, uh, compilations of poetic texts. Uh, and that's traditionally been written down. And then uh, starting about 100 years ago, there's been print, uh, these, these efforts to put it into print. And there's a whole interesting kind of cycling in terms of textual cycling here. Now, since those early uh, efforts to print the repertoire, there's been various efforts to reform the language. So uh, an early claim was that um, a lot of the manuscripts and the early printed sources uh, had lots of errors. Some of them errors uh, from copying, some of them errors from listening, and some of them errors connected to the level of education of performers. Uh, and there's an element of this that also has to do with Jewish performers uh, not having a strong background in classical Arabic. So there's been uh, these kinds of uh, efforts to kind of correct uh, this, uh, these written <coughs> things and bring them uh, into line with a kind of modern sense of, of, of classical Arabic. Now, the, um, one of the interesting things, though, that comes up here, and there's, this is actually an idea that came up 100 years ago uh, by, uh, by a linguist named Colin, who was living in Algeria, was that, in fact, <coughs> some of these things are thought of as solecisms, are, in fact, reflections of, uh, of Andalusi uh, dialectical, uh, dialectal terms. So uh, that's a very interesting uh, kind of <coughs> avenue that I haven't really explored that much. Um, but that's certainly kind of uh, uh, something that comes up. And you'll find some people who, s who really resist very strongly cor kind of co correcting. And they won't say it's because uh, that it reflects uh, uh, in kind of archaic form of, of Arabic, uh, but they'll say, that's not how I learned it. Like, I prefer to go by how I learned it from my teacher. Uh, and so you'll get this kind of tension. Now, the opposite thing, uh, a kind of different example has to do with instruments. And uh, you know, early music revival in North America and, and Europe has a lot of kind of fetishization of the instrument and of the kind of the, the historically accurate instrument, uh, you know, uh, period instruments and all that. Uh, that's something that we, we find the hints of this in North Africa, such as people who say, oh, I don't really think we should be <coughs> playing um, saxophone in the ensemble, or uh, I don't really like the banjo, or uh, it's better to play oud instead of mandolin, or better to play kanun instead of piano. But in fact, most, uh, uh, I'd say that's a minority view. I think most people are fairly kind of laid back about instrumentation. Um, so in Algeria, certainly, there's been a century of using piano, of using mandolin, of using banjos, alongside of oud, alongside of the bab, uh, alongside of violin and viola, which are basically kind of indigenized. Uh, so, uh, it's very, uh, in fact, that's a kind of an opposite of an archaicizing impulse, right? And so this com comes down to a kind of ideology of authenticity. It's not that people say, oh, this is inauthentic. It's simply that there's uh, uh, not a kind of fetishization of the instrument. The instrument is not uh, the main place where that is, is located. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. The post-colonial politics question is something um, that uh, covered in blue. All right, cool. uh, the post-colonial politics question is really interesting. So, uh, 
there's been, uh, I alluded to this kind of claim that, uh, that this Andalusia label is problematic, right? So, and this is something mainly connected to mid 20th century uh, nationalist intellectuals, although not only, um, who have made claims, who have said, well, Andalusian music is uh, a problematic term, maybe uh, a term that is basically um, something that worked toward the colonizer's advantage, and that we should be talking about this using other names, uh, whether these names, like Ala or Almanti or Maluf, or preferably by classical music, right? Uh, musique savant, right? learned music, uh, national classical music, Moroccan classical music, Algerian classical music, Tunisian classical music, Maghrebi classical music. Right? So there's been these calls to use a different meta-generic label uh, since the 1950s. Um, those have not been very successful, though. Uh, people tend to use this or these other terms. And, uh, you know, the musicians that you're interacting <coughs> with are not particularly politicized. They're not politicized in that way. In that way. In that way, yeah. I mean, uh, they're certainly politicized, uh, uh, but simply not in, in, in that particular way. So maybe people will sometimes, you'll, you'll sometimes hear people say, oh yeah, like, maybe we shouldn't call this Andalusi. But people call it Andalusi. Like, it, it's, it's the term that, that, that comes up a lot. And, um, and uh, but the other piece of this is that the, the nationalists uh, who were calling for this to be called Moroccan classical music or, or Maghrebi classical music were not saying this is not from al -Andalus. They were simply trying to emphasize the North Africanness of it, right, and the nationalness of it, um, and the classicalness of it. Um, so, uh, and those, I mean, what, what happens with uh, practitioners now is you have this big repertoire of names you can draw upon, and in what's great about having a big repertoire is you can do lots of things with that, right? You can differentiate, you can combine, you can make gestures toward a kind of uh, nationalist uh, 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 rhetoric. You can kind of totally ignore that. Um, but for me, the, in this post-colonial question, I, I do think there's post-colonial things all over the place here. And that's, the, it, but it's, uh, but what for me is fascinating is how this is uh, uh, working very much against a kind of official narrative, which actually erases um, the colonial period uh, and the indigenous experience of the colonial period. Right. So if we think about like how people talk about sometimes Andalusian music, it's often like this survived all of from 1830 to 1962, and look, and it survived, but just barely we got to recuperate it. But if you talk to people, people will say, you know, there uh, this underwent a major change around 1900. And here are the people, and we can show you the people. Mm -hmm. And there is continuity in the associations. The association that was formed in 1925 is still around today. Um, and so uh, I actually think there's a real kind of profound uh, critique that's not consciously political, mm -hmm. but is, uh, is actually uh, quite profound um, going on here. It's more additive rather than sort of a reduction of snapshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, couldn't see 1962 as a rupture. Right, it's not a rupture, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, what's interesting was that, like in Algeria, the people were very, especially these early years, right after 1962, there's actually a really sophisticated sense of that, of that not being a rupture. Or, it, uh, you know, there's a great line from uh, a conference that was held uh, just after independence about music. Um, and it was right around the time of the Algiers Charter. And so this is like, and this tells you that music is very important, by the way, that people were immediately. Uh, having a conference, bringing people from all over Algeria to talk about music. Uh, and they talked a lot about Andalusian music, but not just that. So, and there's lots of rhetoric about kind of uh, this being a national classical music. But one of the things they say is, they say, uh, and I'm forgetting if this is from that, from the Algiers Charter, but they say, no revolution is a total rupture of the past. They say that very clearly. Uh, there's like a real sense that there's a kind of continuity, um, and that there's a kind of consciousness of that continuity. And there's also consciousness of some kind of major change underway. But for me, that's like an awareness of this notion of tradition that's very sophisticated. And that doesn't show up at the level of kind of, uh, of, kind of the stock nationalist narrative, right? But you know, these are key people. These were you know, minister of culture, 
uh, saying these kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, and kind of the story of what happens to that, I, I don't know what the story of that is in Algeria in, uh, in the mid-60s and into the 70s, but I think it's very striking that, that uh, there's this very sophisticated, very nuanced sense of temporality and of the social outwork there. Are there any other questions there? Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. So we've talked briefly about Rai, and I understand that's particular to Algeria, right? Mm -hmm. And there's obviously Andalusia in a big in a you know, complicated mm -hmm. way that the mm -hmm. label walks. But mm -hmm. is there just interplay between Andalusian music and other kinds of music in these countries that is, you know, on the instrumental, lyrical, mm -hmm. generic level? Sure, absolutely. And I mean, for me, uh, you know, when I talk about genre, I mean, genre is always part of a generic field. A genre field. So, uh, and there's going to be certain kinds of things that are going to be put at the opposite, right, at the opposite end, like rai, uh, and that are kind of necessary. Uh, it's kind of a thing that people just do. But there's all the other things <coughs> that are going to be near at hand. So there's like, uh, you know, so for, that's why I talk about the kind of the fuzzy boundaries of genre, mm -hmm. right? So if you go to the kind of that fuzzy end of of the Andalusian music scene, uh, particularly in Algiers, it overlaps with sometimes called uh, Algiers shabby. So these are also known as qsayi. Uh, so these are colloquial, or they're, you know, somewhat uh, <coughs> kind of elevated colloquial songs. Um, uh, much kind of simpler structure than, say, the nyumba. Uh, very kind of word-centered. And what happens is, in fact, those uh, uh, shabi and other forms of, of qsayi get connected to, to the nyumba. <laughs> in interesting ways in performance contexts. So what you'll usually see at a concert or in a kind of informal uh, musical gathering is people do the nuba first, and then they go into qsai. And you'll have lots of people who will uh, basically come for the qsai, not for the nuba. Uh, because, uh, and then, you know, performers will complain, they'll say, ah, like, you know, <laughs> it's only people who are interested in qsai. And this is even true internally to the nuba. I mean, I'm not talking about musical structure here much, but this five-part structure in the Algiers Kalimsan tradition, the last two movements are considered kind of light, lighter and more popular, and are in fact shared with lots of other genre formations. Uh, and even within the nuba, when you kind of cross the line into the fourth or that fifth movement, um, people start clapping or dancing or ululating. You know, like it's suddenly a kind of a much more participatory kind of uh, uh, presentation, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, there's all many, many threads in terms of those connections. Encores and hilt. Excuse me. Encores and hilt. Encores, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and, uh, and uh, people are really, uh, you know, uh, and that idea of kind of educating an audience to listen to the hard movements, uh, people talk about that. That's particularly true for a lot of female performers you know, who uh, are soloists and who don't want to be associated with these more popular genres that are often also gendered, um, right? Uh, more associated with, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, either male and female audiences or female audiences. So um, you know, that's certainly a concern that comes up. Any other questions? I can address. Uh -huh. I wish you would sing again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, then we would we could have to play music. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so um, I, I don't know. I don't know what you have it on, but I, I plug the <coughs> computer into the thing. If you make sure that the this laptop is button is pressed. <coughs> so I'm gonna play. Um, this is something that's um, one of the. Uh, unmetered kind of vocal improvisations using a uh, kind of beloved text um, called Ye Ahla Andalus. It's uh, or People of El Andalus. Uh, and it's a from a poem by the medieval Andalusi poet Ibn Khafaja. Now most uh, Andalusi performers do not talk about these texts as being authored by individuals. So uh, some people know this is by Ibn Khafaja, but, but most people would say it's from the tradition, it's from from the patrimony. Uh, and uh, this is being sung by Sheikh Larab ibn Sari. So he's this uh, very important figure uh, throughout the 20th century, just up until his death, uh, just after uh, during independence. Um, and this is recorded actually at a conference in Cairo in 1932. Um, and, uh, and I'm just going <coughs> to give a little bit of it. <coughs> 
Um, and let's see if it's gonna. Yeah, it's kind of. So you can hear the mandolin, right? You can also hear the ooh. And this is very much those, one of those moments where the singer is kind of able to address the audience and really I, I think there is a kind of play that goes on here in terms of the idea of quoting from a medieval text or from a tradition that comes has medieval roots and then also playing with this idea of kind of addressing the audience as, as the people of El Andalus. Any other questions? Uh -huh. I just have a question. Um, how uh, much, when you were researching, did you uh, look into the um, migration of the different scales, like the Phrygian, the the Doric, mm. the Ionian? Right, that's a that's a that's something that's been of great interest to people for a long time in terms of of, of matching up uh, the the modes used in the Nuba with uh, kind of the, 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 the Greek modes, right? And, and uh, this, this goes back to uh, the work of a, of a musicologist and composer and performer named Francisco Salvador Damian, uh, who is of Spanish origin, but he in fact uh, grew up in France, and then lived for many years in Algeria and wrote a very important book uh, called La Musique Arabe that was published, uh, it was actually first published uh, in a journal in the 1860s. So he lived in Algeria for many years uh, and was very much interested in this. Uh, he, um, for him, uh, his work was in part a, a, way, a way of trying to kind of interpret uh, music in North Africa, but particularly the Nuba tradition for uh, European readers and listeners, uh, and very much uh, kind of defend, uh, defend this music from people who say, ah, like, it doesn't make any sense, or it you know, sounds messy or whatever. Uh, and uh, he was one of actually a whole kind of scene of Europeans who were living in Algeria who were themselves uh, either aficionados or occasionally practitioners of, of this music. Uh, so uh, he was very much interested in the connections with, with, uh, with a kind of uh, modal system in, in European music. So uh, he was constantly trying to make these connections, but he was also trying to use this in order to develop a theory of modal composition uh, in European art music of his day. Uh, and he actually he wrote a series of very interesting uh, uh, pieces for voice and piano uh, that are based on the modes in, in Algiers and also in Tunis. Um, so uh, for him, it was very much a kind of an experiment, uh, very much invoking this idea of a shared past, a kind of deep past, uh, but of course also a trope of, you know, look, this is an unchanging uh, tradition we can kind of see into <laughs> our own medieval and earlier past by being here. So in that sense, it's of course uh, very much within this kind of orientalist strip of, kind of, uh, of something unchanging, um, but a very interesting kind of political and musical project. And that's something that comes up, uh, th there's still people uh, currently in Algeria and elsewhere who are kind of invoking these kinds of connections and uh, hypothesizing certain kinds of movement uh, um, uh, either between, uh, through Spain or, or through other, other routes. Um, that certainly comes up. Mm -hmm. What was the name of the composer again? Uh, Frances Francisco Salvador Daniel. Okay. Daniel. And it, Francisco is sometimes uh, Francisco and sometimes it is uh, Francesco. Mm 
Uh, and there's a, 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 a new dissertation that actually focuses quite a bit on, on his work. Yeah, fascinating character. And the, the music that you just said was recorded by King Seth II? Nineteen thirty-two, uh, the Congress of Arab Music in Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually lots of recordings of Sheikh Larabi, uh, and then uh, up later of his son as well. Uh, and so these these are kind of foundational figures for people in Tlemcen. So there's an association named after um, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Larabi. So it's called uh, the devotees of of, Sheikh, of Larabi bin Sali. Mm -hmm. Uh, but almost every association in Tlemcen and in Oran, uh, and actually in, in some of the new associations in France of Tlemceni uh, people of Tlemceni <coughs> origin, kind of invoke uh, Sheikh Larbi as a kind of uh, founding figure, as a kind of uh, uh, the kind of founding apology. figure of, of modern North African music or of, of Tlemceni, Tlemceni and the Lucy, the, the Nuba of Tlemcen. So he's taken as kind of the key. Kind of genealogical figure. There are lots of other ones as well, um, but he tends to get taken as a key. Yeah. Maybe this would be, I think we still have a little bit of feedback there. I'm not sure. Maybe this is a good uh, time to thank Jonathan mm -hmm. and, and to give us more. <laughs>